Today, I want to talk about being different, and that is a, a scary thing for us, and yet, I think it's the call of the passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today to uh, live differently. We continue to study, for those of you that haven't been around or you've missed a couple of weeks, we continue to study the fall of Babylon or the fall of Rome. And we're reading this section from the book of Revelation that talks about really the punishment and the destruction of Babylon. And in the middle of it, we're going to see uh, this important thing for our lives. And that's the truth for the book of Revelation. Oftentimes what we focus on when we study the book of Revelation, we read the book of Revelation, we focus on all the, the crazy language, all the symbolism, all of the metaphor, all of the different numbers, and we go, what, what's this about? And we miss so frequently the important little messages, big messages, but in small sentences it seems, uh, that, are, that are valuable for our lives. And the one today I think is just be different. And the way that this is going to be said is come out. That's the language that Revelation 18 is going to use is come out. And we're going to talk about that. Um, but be different. And today, as we look at this, as we look at the chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, as we begin it, we are going to see this, this clear message that we should come out of the world, that we should be different than the people around us. And here's how it begins in Revelation 18, 1 through 3. After that, this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every evil impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxury. So quick review, Babylon is probably Rome. And in Revelation 17, we read what many have called the obituary of Babylon. And there we see the seven bulls poured out and they are punishment that is coming upon Rome, the city of Rome, the kingdom of Rome. And so we see these seven bulls poured out and the reason that they are being punished, and I've said this so many times, we've moved through the book of Revelation. This is not being done in a vacuum. It's because Rome is persecuting God's people and opposing his plans. Say it another way, he is, they are opposing God, the work of God, the will of God, and they are oppressing his people. And so God is saying there will be an end to this. I will put an end to them. Now, we also saw last week that not only were they oppressing God's people and opposing his plans, but they were pulling others into that direction, do the same thing. They were leading the other nations, the other people into their sinful, idolatrous ways. And they were killing Christians. Not just oppressing, but killing Christians. I've alluded to this before. It's one of my favorite books, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. But the Mark of the Lion series, A Voice in the Wind, if you haven't read it, then you will get a picture of Rome in the first century and what they were doing to Christians like the ones that John is writing to. And they're blasphemous. And we saw this picture of these, this, this name, uh, these names that are blasphemous. And it's a reminder that there was this utter, complete disrespect of God. The way I demonstrated that last week was it was like spitting on a cross or stomping on a Bible. I mean, they, they hate God and what God stands for. And Rome, it rides in the passage we looked at last week. It rides in on the beast, which is this political leader, this political leader that's been empowered by Satan, that speaks on behalf of Satan, is causing people to worship Satan. And Rome rides in on this leadership and God is going to put a stop to it all. Now, there will be a fight, but it's going to be a losing fight for the beast and for Rome and for Satan. Jesus is going to win. And one of the big points of last week is that Jesus is going to win, but he's going to allow us to take part in his victory. And if you go back two weeks, we saw that in that victory, our eternal victorious state, we will celebrate and our celebration will look like worshiping Jesus and throwing our crowns or our trophies at his feet in recognition that we didn't deserve the victory, but it's only through him that we have it. 
Now, as Revelation 17 talked about all that, it reminded us of who we are as Christians. We are testimony bearers. And I mentioned last week that we who are Christians, we have a testimony, a story of what Jesus has done in our lives, how we came to Jesus and how he's changed us. And we should bear that testimony like the first century Christians did with their lives. They died in order to testify to the truth and the reality of Jesus. And it also showed us our identity that we are called or welcomed and we are chosen or selected and we are faithful. This is what Christians are. This is what we come to when we move from being in Adam to in Christ, the way the book of uh, Romans describes it, the way that Paul describes it is going from Adam, being a normal human, to in Christ. And when we're in Christ, we are called and we are chosen and we are faithful. This is our identity. We take on a brand new identity as Christians. So we saw all of that last week in Revelation chapter 17. And the reason I gave you the big review is because we didn't have any equipment here last week. It got snowed in. And so some of you did not hear that at all, I know. And I wanted to get you up to speed because now we continue to read about the same thing, the fall of Babylon, the fall of of Rome. Notice the language is even duplicated here. The nations have become intoxicated on the sinful, idolatrous ways of Rome. The other countries have fallen into the trap of saying, look at all their wealth, look at all their splendor, look at how great it is to live there. We're going to do the things they do in order to be like them, to have what they have. The merchants from the other countries grew rich, and so they weren't only leading their own people astray. They weren't only causing their own Christians to be killed, but they were actually causing other nations. They were the exemplary nation for other countries, other kingdoms to do the same as they were doing. Dispensationalists, which is a futuristic view of the book Revelation, are actually helpful here in reminding us that political and religious ways of Babylon in opposing God and pressing his people. I mean, this is, this is political and religious leaders that are leading a kingdom to pull people away from God that's important to remember that's what we're seeing here my old professor my revelation professor Mike Kuykendall says John forces his readers to view evil Rome's richly deserved demise in the same manner the Old Testament prophets viewed ancient Babylon's richly deserved demise and so this language here as it uses Babylon is reminding readers of something that took place in the Old Testament where Babylon oppressed God's people and God did away with them and the Jewish people who suffered under the hands of Babylon they didn't go oh so sad they said oh good God has set us free from our exile from the pain the suffering that we are in and we now as we read the book of Revelation are supposed to see it in the way, same way. Rome deserves what is coming to them. Now remember we talked about this so frequently as modern American Christians we look at these punishment passages and we say wow that's terrible how could God ever do that? But what we saw earlier in Revelation is that when we see things from a heavenly eternal perspective we will look at God and say oh you were absolutely right. No matter how you punished No matter how you brought justice, we now know you were right. And we're invited to look at God and say, okay, God, I trust you to make the right judgments on the right people throughout history. Now, I will say, I I had this last week and I'll say it again, I have America question mark because what I don't want, I don't want you to go to do what so many people have done and start picking countries and say, well, this is this and this is this. That's not this. I believe that Babylon is Rome, but I think there's great application for our country and every country in the world. If our nation or any nation opposes God and starts to oppress his people, then they will be brought to an end. God won't, won't have it. He is going to end nations that oppose him and oppress his people. But here in our passage, this is like a prolonged ending to Babylon. It's like takes up, uh, like it goes from chapter 16 through 19. I mean, it's like all of a sudden, you know, this long section in the book of Revelation is about the demise of this kingdom. And it's like, why? What's going on here? We're going to talk about it again next week. I know that's what you're rooting for. I want to talk about the demise of Babylon for four straight weeks. Like that's what you were rooting for. It goes on and on and on. And it's almost like, it's almost like, the scary guy or a scary movie, the bad guy, and where you think they die once and then they pop out again and then you think they're dead again and then there's one more time they jump up with the knife before there's a final ending. That's almost what this feels like. It goes on and on and on. Like, okay, I get it. The bulls were poured out. Babylon was destroyed.
destroyed. And then the next chapter is like Babylon is going to be destroyed. And the next chapter is like, let me tell you about the smoke rising up. And I mean, like it goes on and on and on. And Jim McGuigan, who I've quoted a lot as I preach through Revelation, said, says this, the lead up is long drawn out because the issue must be indelibly marked in the mind. They, the fall must be remembered. It must be wanted, longed for. They must be impatient for it so that when it finally comes, it will be relished and absorbed. Now remember, now see, here's, here's what you have, to, you have to remember. This is meant to encourage Christians to continue to serve Jesus even when it's really hard. What these people are facing, what they're facing is internal rejections of truth. I've used this phrase a lot. Internal rejections of truth in the church and opposition around them is growing to the point where they are being killed for their faith in Jesus and what Jesus did for them. And so this book is meant to be encouragement and this long drawn out over four chapters description of the fall of Babylon is meant to say to these people, do not forget that no matter what you face, no matter how terrible things get for you, no matter how many of you die at the hands of these people who are oppressing you, God is going to take care of it. It's almost as if God in his infinite wisdom was like, if I just tell them I'll take care of it, then they won't remember. And it'll be hard for them to continue to serve me when somebody says, hey, if you don't worship the emperor, you die. It'll be really hard for them if I just say, hey, I'm gonna, I'll put an end to them. But instead, the power of the Holy Spirit, John writes, and it carries on and on and on to the point where if you just read the book of Revelation, you'll be like, wow, like almost a fifth of it is devoted to the fall of Babylon. It's hard to forget that God is going to take care of this. He's going to put an end to this kingdom that is opposing him and oppressing his people. Now, I don't want to sound like the person who finds persecution everywhere, but I, I, I think we all kind of agree that, that these things are true in our nation today. There is more opposition to our faith. It seems like every year we are made to feel less and less like our views as Christians our biblical morality, our, our worldview, like it aligns with what the rest of people think, right? And, and it seems that opposition to us is growing here and, and there are internal rejections of truth in the church around our country. We see that in entire denominations that, that are rejecting scripture, frankly, and, and saying, hey, like it doesn't really apply to us anymore. And we need to know, we need to remember that even if, even if this growing level of distrust and disdain for Christians, even if it grows to the point where we are arrested and beaten and killed for our faith, that we should continue to serve Jesus because why? God is going to put an end to the people that oppose him and oppress his people. And so he goes on for four chapters describing the fall of Babylon. And the language here is taken from fall of literal Babylon or old Babylon. Isaiah 13, 19 through 21, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. There no nomads will pitch their tents. There no shepherds will rest their flocks, but desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill their house, houses. There the owls will dwell. And there the wild goats will leap about. What we picture, what the description is here is that Rome will become like a ghost town or a haunted house. Like there will be nothing of life left within its borders. God wants you to know that you should keep serving him even when it's hard. But notice this other thing. It's a really important theme in our passage. This angel comes and he's given great authority. The earth is illuminated by his splendor and he shouts with a mighty voice. There's this incredible might displayed here, even in the angel who is a representative of God. And at the end of our passage, we are going to see that God is called mighty, outright. Why? Why is this section about the fall of Babylon sandwiched? Why does it start and end with this very important, specific statement about the mightiness of our God? And I think it's because we as Christians, we can feel like God is not in control. 
we can look around in our own country, right, and go, wow, how, like, God's letting this happen? Like, it doesn't seem like he's making the right decisions. It seems like the real power is the government and the media and these things around us. Like, is, and we can begin, I believe, to start to question, is God actually in control of all this? Is he really taking care of us to ask that question more personally? And so, so we begin and we end with statements about God's might. Jim McGuigan again says, the Lord never tires to tell his people in this book that heaven is completely in control of things. The sovereignty of God is one of the key themes of this book, that God is ultimately in control. Now he allows for people to have certain levels of authority and power here on earth. Even Satan himself is called the prince of the earth. There's some level of uh, allowance that God, for whatever reason, gives to even Satan on this earth. But we should never forget that our God reigns, that our God is absolutely in control, that our God is sovereign. Nothing that happens happens without him allowing for it to happen. And when you are struggling to continue to be faithful and you look around, even in your own you know, smaller, and I don't mean that as importance to you, but like lesser global struggles, the things that you deal with, you look around at your own family and say, is God really in control? Because this thing's a mess, right? Like, especially if you have like people in your life that aren't Christians and they're looking at you and they're being mean to you about it and you don't feel like you fit in at Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know, like, and, and you're going like, is God really in control of this? Or in the workplace and you're struggling to live out your faith at work and you're looking around and it's like everything is set up to make you go the opposite direction of what you know God would want you to be like. Like you're set up to lie a little bit or you're set up to cut some corners or you're set up to skim a little off the top and not tell people. It's all set up for you to not serve God in the workplace. And you can look around and be like, really? It, doesn't, it feels like you know, the CEO is in control but not God. And, and this mighty statements, these mighty statements of God's character and nature, even his servant's character and nature, show us what? That God is in control. And then there's this incredible call to repentance. Listen to verses four through eight. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow, I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. I see here that the sins are stacked up to heaven in this, this kingdom, this city. They're stacked up to heaven. And what does God say? God describes like she is going to get, Rome is going to get what is coming to it, to her. It's going to be a double portion. It's going to be as much torment and grief as she gave uh, is going to be poured back on her. Like it, the end is coming. But the thing that's been surprising to me that I've loved about preaching through the book of Revelation, some of you already know this, is that as we've moved through it, there is always this call to repentance in the middle of the promise of punishment. It's like always there. And it's subtle and it's sometimes little. This one's less subtle. Come out of her, my people. We should be different than the people around us. And, and obviously this, my people, that's a statement for Christians first, right? Like we need to come out and we need to not be like the, the culture around us. We need to not in, in, to engage in the sins of the culture around us. Jeremiah 58 says, flee out of Babylon, leave the land of the Babylonians and be like the goats that lead the flock. You see, if you would go back to the Old Testament when the Jewish people were in captivity in Babylon, uh, they started to embrace the ways of Babylon and they started to make it their home. It was like, well, we're here, we're stuck here, there's no end in sight, we're here, we're gonna build our houses, we're gonna hang out, we're gonna embrace their gods, we're gonna live their lives, we're gonna be like them. 
And here in our passage, we were, are reminded of what God said to the Jewish people and what he's always said to his people. Come out of that. Be different. Don't be like the culture around you. God doesn't want us to embrace the ways of our land, whether it's America or Babylon or, you know, Rome. God wants us to be different and separate. The word holy means set apart. We should look different than the culture around us. That should just be true of Christians. We need to be holy. We need to be set apart. We should be different from our culture. We need to come out and we need to avoid the sins that everybody else embraces as good. Now, it's important to remember what the backdrop is here. All of this is going to be destroyed. All of this bad stuff is going to be destroyed. So why should we be embracing it as our own? We should be different knowing that that stuff is going to find the justice that it deserves. Like the Israelites, we are not home in America or in our country, right, and on the world. Our home is in heaven where we have a king. His name is Jesus. We are not citizens of this earth, as it says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, or Hebrews 13.14. For this world is not our home. We are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. One of the sad realities for modern American Christians and modern Christians in general is that we have made the earth our home. We have embraced the culture around us as our own. And here, as the punishment is described, God says, come out, be different, don't give in to these sins. And it's done in the midst of this big warning, and I think that's important. It reminds me of this this, 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 the language come out. Um, this thing that happened to me when I was a kid. I was, uh, we were in, we were in, uh, I think it's Woodland, um, California, which is just uh, north of Sacramento. I think it's Woodland, and and that's where we would stop when we would go to Disneyland when I was a kid. We'd always sleep in this hotel. It must have been cheap or something, and we'd always stay in the same hotel. And it was a it was a fine hotel until uh, one day it wasn't, uh, and then it wasn't so great anymore. And it seemed like the area had changed around it. But we didn't get the memo on that uh, that the area had changed around it, and and maybe this was not the hotel that you wanted to be in. It, you know, maybe it was moving towards being like a rent by the hour kind of hotel like not the not the place you want to be in and so we um we're we're in this hotel and it it seems all fine and I I get into the hot tub and uh and I'm in the hot tub and I don't know I'm maybe I'm maybe nine years old you know old enough to be in the hot tub while my family's watching me from a distance or whatever and my grandma who's right over here she comes up to me and and uh my grandma's never very stern with me but she's like get out of the hot tub right now why i'm enjoying the hot tub there's a long eight hour drive down here you know and she's not joking around like she's like you get out of the hot tub and and as i'm like just i don't know what's going on really i'm thinking like am i gonna obey you know am i not it's like this guy starts to get into the hot tub and he's fully dressed fully dressed he gets into the hot tub and i'm like okay she's right you know (laughs) like this is and it's clearly like not somebody who's it's not like, you know, like it felt uncomfortable all of a sudden. Like I could tell something was wrong here. And so I get out of the hot tub and um, I'll just tell you the end of the story. That night, uh, somebody was stabbed in the hotel. I, I, not me, uh, because I got out of the hot tub, right? And here I think what we see in this language is like God is playing the role of my grandma here and saying, get out. Like you need to come out of there right now. And we can be like nine, 10 year old Chad who's like, why, you know? Like what's the big deal? It's not that big a deal. We fail to see the warning that God is giving us. Don't be like this because this is all going to get destroyed. In fact, try to be different. You are holy, you've been made holy, so live a holy life. That's what God's saying to us here. And you know what we're like? As Christians, too often, we're like, all right, I see that this is bad. I see that there will be justice brought. I know from the Bible that punishment is coming, but let me like, let me just dip my toes in a little, right? Like it's just, it's, you know, it looks nice. 
It's been a long eight-hour drive, you know? It's been a long day. It's just, it just, it feels good to sit in the hot tub. Like, let me just, maybe God, and so we'll dip our toes, and then, then we're like, you know what? I've dipped my toes, and it, it did feel good, so maybe I should just get my legs in, right? Like, maybe I should, maybe I should just kind of, you know, get the legs in, and I'll just warm up my legs for a little bit. It feels good. I've been sitting. They were cramped all day, and eventually, you know, we, we jump all the way in, and what God is saying here is like, get out, like, that's not how we're supposed to live as Christians, right? Like, we are supposed to live a different life than the people around us who aren't following our Savior and our King, Jesus. And so for those of us that are Christians, I mean, this is so clear, right? Like, it's a call to repentance of the places and the areas, the sins that we are committing. It's the spots we're just dipping our toes in, we're taking a little dip, you know, and saying, it's okay, God, it's okay. Like, because I'm saved by your blood and it's gonna be okay, but I'm gonna embrace all this. And God is saying, hey, I'm going to destroy this. And I'm gonna destroy the ones who are pushing this upon the earth. And I'm going to bring punishment to those that are opposing me and standing in the way of the things that I want. And so get out now. Just one more time to make it so clear and hopefully personal for you. Look at your life. This is the call. And ask yourself where you are embracing the sins of culture and stop like today. I'll give you a chance at the end to respond as I always do. And some of you I know need to bow your heads and you say, hey God, I've been doing this, but I'm coming out of it right now. Please help me. Now, there's also this this important, you know, for anybody who's not a Christian, like God does punish. And it's not my favorite thing to preach about. You may not know that because I'm preaching about it like six weeks in a row right now, but it's not my favorite thing to preach about, but it's real. God is going to put an end to the systems, the organizations, the leaders that oppose him and oppress his people. And and if you're not on his side, then you don't get the victory that Jesus offers. And so not only should we who are Christians come out, but you should come all the way out and you should give your life to Jesus. It, it It is imperative that you follow Jesus because then you get to be free from punishment. And not only do you get to be free from punishment, but you get to move into a new realm. You get to be called and you get to be chosen. You get to be faithful and you get to have the victory that Jesus bought and won with his blood on the cross. I'm gonna talk more about this next week, but I get, I get for you who aren't Christians that the ways of this world are intoxicating, so intoxicating, in fact, that you don't even sometimes see the evil of it. I talked about Las Vegas last night. I mean, Las Vegas is, or last week, um, Las Vegas is beautiful and it's intoxicating in its own way. And yet the underbelly of it is so ugly and gross. And so sometimes people who aren't Christians, you, I, just, I would just say to you, like, think about, think about the ugliness of what you're in and heed the warning of the book of Revelation and give your life to Jesus. Because what we believe as Christians, and I hope all of you know this, is that, that all of us were fully immersed in the hot tub. We all were moving towards an eternal destruction. Like that's where we were headed. But Jesus, he stepped down out of heaven and he came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived completely sinlessly. He did everything right. And at the end of that sinless, perfect life, he suffered the consequences of us and all of the swims, the hot tub dips that we have taken, all of the sins that we have committed. He took it, he took it all for us on the cross. He died and then he came back to life. He conquered sin and death. And all we have to do, all we have to do is say, Jesus, I believe that that is true. I repent, I'm giving my life to you. And so for Christians and non-Christians alike, the only reason that we can repent, that we can come out, the only reason is Jesus. Otherwise, we were stuck there. It was cement to us. We could not come out. But Jesus, he suffered and died on our behalf and came back from the dead in order that we may come out. And so come out, give your life to him and live your life for him. And then verse eight says, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her mighty is the Lord God. The nations of the earth think they're mighty. 
The people in power in the nations of the earth, they think they are mighty. It's not just an American thing, right? Russia, China, all the other nations, they think they have some great level of power. But what we see here and what we'll see even more clearly next week is that their might, their power, their authority, it is nothing, nothing compared to God. Revelation 18, 1 through 8, it begins with this great statement of mightiness and it ends with this great statement of mightiness and it's all to remind us that nobody can thwart the plans of God. There's no standing up to him. There's no amount of nuclear weapons that's going to prevent God doing what God wants to do. There's no amount of wealth that a nation can acquire that's going to prevent God from doing what God wants to do. And so when a nation stands up against God and his people and hurts his people, then God, it's, it's not like it's going to be like a hard fight for him. I mean, we even see in our description here in Revelation that, that they, they all get ready for this great battle against God. And then we don't even like read about the fight. It's like, it's just God wins. He wins because it's not a fight for him. This isn't a fight. When God wants to, to do something, God does something. And so we should give our lives to him. We should be on his side because that's the only way to victory. And not only should we be on his side, we should be living our lives for him and stop dipping our toes in the hot tub that is the world in its sinful ways. Revelation is meant to encourage Christians. It's meant to call us to continue to serve God when it's hard, despite the external pressure and the internal rejections of truth. That is true even when the nation you live in opposes God so strongly that it pulls other nations away. You need to keep living for God. Why? Because your country is not in control. Our God is. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. The mightiness of God is a key theme in scripture. Psalm 24, 8, who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Psalm 51, the mighty one, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. Psalm 93, 4, which we read earlier, my favorite psalm to think about at the beach. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. And Psalm 147, 5, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. God is mighty, so come out of the world and be holy. That's what this passage is saying to us. I want to read you just one, uh, two more verses because I think that they are uh, a great representation of what we're being called to in our passage today. They're part of this section on idolatry. It contains the very famous and uh, you know high school youth group uh, verses, phrases, don't be unequally yoked. Like if you grew up in the church, you've heard that about not marrying people, but it's beyond that. It's about not being tied to people who are gonna cause you to worship something besides God. And in that section, we read this, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 18. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God is mighty, so come out, leave your sins behind. Let me pray that you will. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are in control. (laughs) Too often I feel like I'm in control of my life and uh, too often I worry about the other powers around me, Lord. But you are the sovereign God. You are the great almighty God. Um, From the rising of the sun to its setting, God, you are in control. And I pray that all of us would believe that and take hold of that. And when it seems like the world is crumbling around us, God, I pray that we would remember that you are the one in control. And if you are allowing something to happen, then it is for the good of those you love. God, it is for the good of those of us who serve and follow you. I pray, Lord, for all of us here today that I know there's sin in each of our lives and I I pray that this would be a reminder, God, for those of us who are Christians that we need to come out of those sins. We need to leave those sins behind. We need to touch no unclean thing, as it says in 2 Corinthians. And I pray that we would repent of those sins today. We had an awesome opportunity to do that on Ash Wednesday and, and so many did, Lord, and I'm thankful for that and I pray we do that again today. Let us be a people that, that try to live God, in a different way because we love you and we know that you have done great things for us. And finally, Lord, for those who are not Christians watching online, sitting in front of me, God, I pray that they would heed these warnings, God, and they would come out, Lord. Um, You know, I think that people outside of Christianity, even those of us that are Christians sometimes, Lord, we kind of look at you like like I looked at my grandma and we think, is he being crazy? How come he won't let me do this? But God, I pray that we remember that you are 
you are infinitely wise and you are infinitely good. Uh, and, and that we would, we would listen to you and we'd come out. And then people, God, would listen to you and they'd come out and they would accept the gospel. They would accept the story of your salvation, Lord, is true and they would commit their lives to you. I pray all of these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.